moved up here and gives us a lot more room, doesn't it? And uh, so, again, you got a glimpse of a little bit of what it's going to look like. All right, go ahead and, and take your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 3. And this morning, we're going to look at verses 21 through 24, where we find John giving us the secret to getting more of our prayers answered. It's a great text, and uh, I love it. Speaking of prayer, uh, I, I, I've told this story before, but it's a favorite one about the pastor who looked out his window and saw that a dog had chased a kitten up a tree. And the kitten that had climbed the tree was afraid to... Uh, come down. Well, the pastor coaxed and offered warm milk, did everything he could to think of to get the kitten to come down, but the kitten was just too scared. And uh, uh, the tree was not sturdy enough to climb, so the pastor decided on a plan to get the kitten down. He figured if he tied a rope to the tree and then to the bumper of his car, he could drive a little bit forward the tree would then bend, and he could reach up and get the kitten. Well, that was his plan, and uh, as he moved the car forward, the tree began to bend. Then suddenly, without warning, the rope broke, and the tree went boing, and, and the poor ki kitten sailed out of, the, out of sight. And the pastor just felt terrible about it. He had launched this poor kitten. He walked all over the neighborhood asking people if they'd seen a little kitten, and nobody had seen a stray kitten. So he prayed, Lord, I, I just commit this kitten to your keeping, and uh, went on about his business. A few days later, he was at the grocery store, and he met one of his church members, and he happened to look in her shopping cart and was surprised to see some cat food she had bought. And uh, he knew that she was a dog lover and not a cat lover, and he said, I, I didn't know you had a cat. She said, Peter, you won't believe this. And uh, she told him how her little girl had been begging her for a cat, but she kept telling her no. Well, the little girl kept on begging, and her mother finally had enough, and out of desperation told the little girl, well, if God gives you a cat, then I'll let you keep it. She said, I watched my child go out into the backyard, get down on her knees to pray, and really, Pastor, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, a kitten suddenly came flying out of the blue sky and landed right in front of her. <laughs> Isn't that a good story? Well, just like that little girl got her prayers answered, as I said, John's going to give us uh, the secret to having a better prayer life. Let's, let's read our text. Now, it's going to begin in verse number 21, but if you allow me first, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions first about your prayer life. And take out your outlines and uh, look at question number one. Now, this was a survey among church people, and the question was asked, how, what do you think the average is that most Christians pray each day? A, B, or C, what do you think? How many for A? Got a few of you, one to two minutes. How about B, three to five minutes? Well, if you circle letter B, you would be correct. The average Christian only prays on an average of just three to five minutes a day. And the three things they pray for are for their food, their safety, and for personal blessings. Now, look at question number two. It gets a little bit more personal here. On a scale of one to ten, and each number representing just one minute, Circle the number that you estimate is the closest to the amount of time that you spend each day praying. If it's more than 10 minutes each day, then circle that. You'll see 10 plus, so it could be a lot more. So the question I want to ask you, did you go ahead and circle the number? Um, look at it 
and be honest, does your prayer life need some work? Does it need an overhaul? Um, and so that, that's my introduction this morning for this text. Now, my, my mother taught me the importance of prayer when growing up. My mother was a woman of prayer. She made prayer a priority in her life and also in our life. And I've told you this before, but she made a prayer room in our house. We had a three-bedroom home. And uh, we grew up there on Canton Road, and there were six of us in the house. My sister had her own room, and when my sister moved out, uh, my parents, uh, well, my bedroom, but into a prayer room. And uh, what a prayer room was, uh, I, I really didn't understand it, but... Um, she got it ready, and she explained that the only time we were allowed to go into this room was to meet with God. And uh, we could read our Bibles, we could pray, and we could do Bible study. We're not allowed to do homework in there. And uh, so it was a reminder because I would pass this room to get to our room. And so it was a reminder every day, every morning, every evening. And I would go in there. And I would just talk to God. What an amazing principle uh, that my mother uh, taught us about prayer. And it had a, a really profound influence in my life. All right, let's read our text beginning in verse number 21. All right, here we go. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. This is the commandment that we should believe on the name of, the, name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. All right. Now, number three in your outline. What does John say here is the prerequisite to having a greater confidence with God there in verse number 21? He says this. He says, if your heart does not condemn you, then you'll have a greater what towards God? A greater confidence towards Him. Now, what does He mean if our heart does not condemn us? We talked a little bit about this last week. I said last week that as believers, there are times that we're not going to live perfectly like Christ. There's going to be times that we're going to sin. There's going to be times that the good we know we should do, we end up not doing. We have that struggle. Now, throughout this entire chapter, John has been talking about our responsibility to love one another as Christ loved us. Now, I told you that that's hard to do, isn't it? I mean, I try to love Greg as much as I can, but, you know, it get, it's rough. I'm just kidding. I always picking on him. I should pick on Mark a little bit more back there. Um, but... He even told us in verse number 18, our memory verse, say it with me. You should know it by heart now. My little children, let us love not in word, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in what? Deed and in truth. And he said in verse number 18 that we should be willing to lay our life down for one another. And in verse 17, he talked about how that we need more compassion for others, right? 
And, and I don't know about you, but when I read this, I fall far short of that. I don't know about you, but I do. I, I can't quite <laughs> love my brother like Christ loved us. And I even read an article that just floored me the other day. You guys, you, you all heard about the New Zealand massacre, didn't you? Uh, a gunman targeted two mosques, killing at least 50 people and injuring dozens more. And he seemed to be a white supremacist. And, uh, but listen to this. Now, the reason I'm bringing it up is how far short we come. But I want you to hear what a Muslim said. A survivor of one of the mosque shootings his wife was among those that was killed by this attacker. Here's what he said. Now, this is coming from a Muslim. I don't have any grudge against him, said uh, Farad Ahmed. His spouse was shot dead as she ran into the mosque to save him. He said, I have forgiven him. And I'm praying for him that God will guide him and then one day he will be a savior, which we know is, 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 it can't happen. But um, he also said that the Muslim community where he is from, we're not going to retaliate. And he said, I lost my wife, but I don't hate the killer. As a person, I love him. I can't support what he did, but I think that somewhere along in his life, maybe he was hurt, but he could not translate that hurt in a positive manner. And here I have a Muslim who doesn't know Christ. And I'm not trying to promote the Muslim religion by any, it's a cult, but here we see a Muslim showing love towards Others, But again, that's what Christ has called us to do. All right, let me bring it all back together again. I, I gave all that to show that we fail miserably in this area. And we mistreat our brothers. And so when that happens, we can feel guilty. We can feel even condemned. Look in verse number 20. Look what it says when you sin can happen. When you're not demonstrating the things and, and pleasing God. He said your heart will condemn you. It'll make you feel guilty. Now I want you to understand that's a wonderful thing. To feel guilty. To have a guilty conscience. The guilty conscience is what I call the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And, and that is um, a blessing, even though we try to run from it, don't we? When you feel guilty, you try to cover it up. In number five in your outline, it says in the book of Ephesians that that guilt is also accompanied by grieving the Holy Spirit that's inside of you. That's a part of the conviction process. That conviction, this feeling guilty over your sin is an absolutely wonderful tool. It's a pain sensor that God has given to you. Think about this for a minute. What would happen if you did not have a pain sensor? Let's say, ladies, you're cooking, and I'm finding this out. Man, I've burnt myself I don't know how many times. But I'll reach down, and if you didn't have a pain sensor... You'd destroy your flesh, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd pull away right, right away because you do have that pain sensor. Well, when the Holy Spirit goes into action, He produces the guilty conscience, speaks to your heart, and that's the action that takes place when you sin. You'll hear sometimes a very loud voice telling you that what you're doing is wrong. That's just not your conscience. That's the Holy Spirit of God reminding you that you're His child. So then why do people run from it? They try to bury it with pills. They try to bury it with alcohol. They try to run from it. 
Try to stay busy. But it's a wonderful truth. So, in verse 21, he's telling us that you can have, as a believer, that you can experience a heart, however, that does not condemn you. That does not condemn you. And what is that called? Write it there beside verse number 21. A heart that does not condemn you, it is called having a clear conscience before God and others. It means you have a clear conscience. It means as a believer, you're in fellowship with God and you're in a right relationship with Him. Now, look at number five in your outline. I wanted to give you this. Um, I want to give you several steps to having a clear conscience before God. Number seven. Is that what I said? Yeah, number seven. No, maybe not. Look at number seven. Yeah, that's right. It's number seven in your outline. Now, John it describes for us three practical things that we can do in order to have a clear conscience before God in verses 22 and 23. Can you guess what they are? Let me give them to you. Three practical things to having a clear conscience before God. And look what he says. In verse number um, 21, it says, A heart does, that does not condemn us not, that condemns us not, and, and, and in verse 22, it says, Because we keep his what? Commandments. Now, that's number one. We keep his commandments. And what is his commandment? It's to walk in faith. Because he tells us what his commandment is. In verse 23, this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. So, the first thing is, is that you're walking in faith. You've trusted Christ as your Savior, and you're trying to abide in Him. The second thing is, he says, verse number 22, we do those things that are pleasing in His sight. You see that? You're obeying God. You're doing everything that you know what to do to please Him. Uh, you you, you, you uh, um, are obeying Him in every area of your life. And then he says in verse number 23, the third thing is that you are to love one another as He gave us commandment. So you put all those three things together, obeying God's commandments, pleasing Him, and, uh, you know, abiding in Him, walking in fellowship with Him, and loving one another as He gave us commandment. So what will that produce? It will produce a clear conscience before God. This should be your desire every waking moment of your day. It should be the first thing that you think about in the morning when you get up out of bed. I have a morning ritual. I go over memory verses as I'm laying there because I don't want to get up. <laughs> now, I'll repeat those verses and then I'll say, God, I, my, my desire for you is that I'll please you as you speak to me throughout the day. You know, and, and that should be uh, your, your, your utmost desire. So those are some practical things. Okay, you, you, you're saying, uh, that's, you told us how to have a clear conscience, but I've already blown it. I'm experiencing a guilty conscience before God. How do I deal with that? Look at number eight. And I've talked about this before. We did in chapter one. Let me give you a couple steps to clearing your conscience. When your conscience accuses you, when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, look back and ask the question, why? You're going along pretty well, and suddenly that inner alarm goes off and says, stop right there. That wasn't right. Don't just ignore it. Why are you saying this to me, God? This is what we call the pricking of your conscience. 
It's given to you as a gift. And it's not to cause you to doubt your salvation. His whole process is simply to make you more holy. That's what this whole process is about. It is to live out your salvation in a way that pleases God. So when your alarm goes off, your conscience is tripped, it's being pricked, deal with it. Maybe you spoke impatiently with your brother or sister in Christ and you need to mend that relationship. Maybe you made a decision motivated by pride or greed or envy and you need to reconsider whatever the case. Rather than ignoring your conscience, let your conscience drive you to Christ or let the Holy Spirit's promptings drive you to Him. Why God? And believe me, He will tell you why. He will tell you why. Even, be, even if your conscience doesn't prick you, if you go to God in prayer and you, go, and you ask Him, Lord, and you have a, a paper and a pen, and you just ask this question, Holy Spirit, would you take inventory in my heart? Would you look in my heart and see if there's anything that I'm doing that is displeasing you? And you wait just a moment or two. You'll get so frustrated, you'll get up like I do and throw the pen and throw the paper away and say, man, this is too much to deal with. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. He'll, he'll speak to your heart. And uh, so don't ignore your conscience or bury it. Let it drive you to Christ. Don't let it condemn you to thinking that you're not a child of God. In fact, the closer you get to Christ, the more miserable you are going to be as a Christian. Did you hear what I said? The closer you get to Christ, the more miserable you are going to feel as a Christian. You're going to feel that you don't measure up. If Christ were to come here and sit down beside you, how would you feel? <laughs> I mean, in comparison to him, you're going to feel like you're the worst sinner in the world, right? That's what I feel like. So don't let it cause you to think that you're not a Christian. All right, so here's the three things. Uh, clear your conscience by repentance and confession of your sin. That's the fill in the blank there. Repentance and confession of your sin. And a good verse to use is what? 1 John 1, 9. Say it with me. It was our first memory verse. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I said that verse is the most well-worn verse for the believer. It should be. Repentance is involved in that. Don't just confess it. Repentance means you're going to have a, a change of thinking about it. I don't care if you feel sorry or not for that sin. Are there some sins that you can commit that you don't feel sorry for? Yes. But if you repent and turn away from it and choose not to do it, I would rather have no feelings of sorrow, repent and not doing it again, than feeling sorry and not repenting. Does that make sense to you? There's times I, I, I can't muster up a feeling. It felt good ripping on Greg. I mean, it really did. I, I felt good about it. I, but then I know I, I got to repent and I'm not going to do it again. I didn't feel sorry, but we, you know, you should, we, we should hope that we feel sorry. Don't try to work that up. God will give you a godly sorrow for it. There are times, and I want to get to that place, and I'll ask God, God, break my heart for some sins that I commit. So a good verse to use is 1 John 1, 9. And then after confessing and repenting, this is forgotten by so many people. Begin to praise Him and thank Him for His cleansing. That'll help you if you thank Him and praise Him for cleansing you of that sin that you just committed. It'll help you not to go back the next day and confess the same thing over and over because you believe that he hasn't cleansed you. How many have done that before? You feel so guilty, you keep on confessing the same sin over and over and over. We'll begin praising him, thanking him. I, I, I thank him. Sometimes I'll, well, I burn my carpet in my office by lighting it, on it writing it down on a piece of paper. I, I burn, I, I wrote down my sins because I just wanted to 
What I did was, in my mind, I wanted it, I don't know why I'm telling you this, why, I, I wanted it to be completely removed from my thinking. So I wrote down a piece of paper, burned it, got too hot, didn't make it to the trash can, and burn a hole in my carpet. <laughs> Anyway, I, what I do now is I don't burn it. I'll write it down, crumble it up, put it in the trash can. Then I take my trash can and I walk all the way down to the dumpster and I put it in the dumpster and I repeat my verses and then I go back into my room. You say, you're, you, that's crazy, Kim. I'll tell you, when that sin comes up and the Satan says, hey, uh, God didn't forgive you, I said, I don't even know where it's at. It's in the trash can and I envision in my mind that the, that the, that the garbage guy has come out in the back and he's taken it and I don't know where it's gone now. And uh, that's what God has done as far as the east is from the west. He has removed my sin from me. And, and so that's what I do. I do practical things like that so in my thinking then I can have peace and I praise him for that. Your Listen to this. Your response to this supernatural assistance in your life should be wonder and awe. This is the Holy Spirit working in your life, showing you that you are His. Right? All right, go back to verse 19 for just a moment. What two things does John say you have when you're in a right or even a wrong relationship with God? Look at it, verses 19. It says, you know that you are of the truth. Just what I said, that you're saved. And it shall assure your heart before him. That's what he says. Even when you're wrong. Did you hear what I'm saying? Even when you're in a wrong relationship, it should assure you that you are God's. And that you are of the truth. That's this whole text in what John is trying to say here. All right. So he knows all about your heart. <clears throat> What an amazing salvation. Now, what does John say? Here we go, number 10 in your outline. What does John say you can have when you confess your sins, clear the air, and walk in truth? In verses 21 and 22. It says, look at it, you can have confidence towards God. And here it is, here's the secret. And whatsoever you ask, you will receive of Him. Did you hear what he says? John says... Because you do those things that are pleasing in His sight, you can go to God with greater confidence that your prayers are going to be answered. When you're in a right relationship with Him, and you've confessed your sin, and dealt with your guilty conscience, He not only hears your prayers, but He will answer your request. May I write this statement down? It's not in your outline. Shame is a barrier to fellowship with God. Guilt and shame is a barrier to fellowship with God. <clears throat> when you sin, you know, you're not confident. You feel weak, powerless. You feel that God is displeased with you. How can you go to him then unless you clear the air? Now, according to verse number 22, look at it. What does John say you will receive when you pray? I love this. Look what he says. He says, whatever you ask, you'll receive. Oh, my soul. Whatever you ask, you will receive. But <clears throat> look at the prerequisite. Does that mean that whatever you ask, God will give it to you? Well, there's a prerequisite, and he tells us what that prerequisite, prerequisite, prerequisite is in verse number 24. What is the prerequisite to receiving whatever you ask for him in prayer? Look what it says. Verse 24, because you're keeping his commandments, you're dwelling in him. And he also says that he is abiding in you. So what does that mean, the prerequisite to answered prayer? It means that you are walking in accordance to God's will. 
you will receive your answer if it is in line with the Holy Spirit as you are walking in fellowship with Him. I want you to understand that when you're out of fellowship with God, or that you're not asking according to His will, then you're not going to receive the answer to your prayers. Some people have come to me and said, I've asked God to give me the digits to the winning billion-dollar lottery. And I believe that He has written them down for me on a piece of paper. And they'll take it, <clears throat> they'll go buy their ticket. Then they'll come and ask me, why didn't God answer my prayer? It says, whatsoever you ask, believe that you receive it. Why didn't I get an answer to it? And, <clears throat> and again, that's not in accordance what it, to what God wants for your life. And so it's just, I think every prayer, and this is the secret to every prayer that we pray, this is it right here. It is saying this, what Jesus said in the garden. Did you know that Jesus got a prayer that wasn't answered? Oh. Let me clarify. He was in the garden, and he said, let this cup pass from me meaning the suffering that he was about to go through. But immediately he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Don't you think I prayed that Kathy would be brought health and that God would spare her life? I ended up, Ian, both of us did, didn't we? We ended up saying, Father, Please heal our wives. But then we had to come to the place that said, Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. And God then accomplished what he needed to accomplish in our lives. So what a powerful truth here this morning. Let's this week abide in Christ, allow his life to flow out of us, and let us walk in truth. Amen. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> there are times that we have prayed that we don't get answers. And there are times that we walk out of fellowship with you. John says that if we would, if our hearts condemn us not, that we'll have greater confidence towards you. Father, cleanse us from any defilement of sin. Help us to have a clear conscience before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, there's so much truth in that.